Um, welcome everyone. I'm Lyle McKinney and um, we have today, our guest is Natalie Torin. She is on the content team at On Deck and she was previously the writing partner for the On Deck Writer Fellowship, uh, ODW for short, which I was in the first cohort of and really enjoyed. Um, she's also been published uh, as a freelance journalist and contributes to a lots, lots of different magazines like New York Magazine's The Strategist, Into the Glass, Toast Magazine, and many, many others. Um, she's kind of a veteran of traditional print media and the fashion industry. Um, so we're going to get into a lot more about your background. And I think that's actually kind of just where I wanted to start, very general. Just uh, maybe you could take us back to how you started writing. Um, you know, first of all, introduce yourself, but then maybe take us back to how you started writing. Like, what were, were you drawn to it like at an early age in school or did it come later on in life? That kind of thing. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Natalie. It's really nice to see uh, some familiar faces and some new faces uh, in the audience. And um, I, uh, yeah, I met, I, I met Lyle and have just had like, been so fortunate to be his colleague since um, the first cohort of uh, the On Deck Writers Fellowship and um, really appreciate just like the general uh, evolution of um, digital writing communities online. I think it's just absolutely incredible and something that we like didn't have access to in the last 10 years really. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's incredibly cool. Um, I think that, uh, I was always really drawn to language and really drawn to stories. And um, my dad is a big comic book nerd. My stepdad used to bring home all sorts of books. Like uh, my best friend in high school is a terrific, amazing, incredible writer. And so we would talk about writing. We would talk about articles. We would read New York Magazine. I grew up in New York City. Um, it's just like, it's a place where media kind of like uh, seeps into your bones at a really early age and you're kind of surrounded by it. Um, so I feel like I've always been pretty like clued in to reading um, and, and reading like newsworthy media, if that makes sense, like magazines and newspapers and op-eds. And we kind of like, I, and then also being really interested in fiction and storytelling. Um, so yeah, I would say I was pretty uh, into it. And then basically when I, I went to university, I did not study writing. I have a really non-traditional writing path. Um, I studied international politics, but I got involved with the school newspaper. Um, I cringe when I think about it, but I wrote a sort of like hybrid fashion politics column for the Georgetown Hoyas, uh, which is the school newspaper of Georgetown. And like some of those columns are actually okay to read. Um, some of them are not, uh, but it's funny because every time I visit my dad, he shows me his like file of all those newspaper clippings that he saved and I'm horrified. Uh, and he's, he, he's convinced that was my best writing ever. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, after that, I really did want to go work in magazines. So I came back to New York City and I got a really fluke opportunity with a magazine called Nylon, um, which is like a very cool, at the time, very hipster downtown New York magazine that was about fashion and music and art and culture and just kind of like all things hip. Um, my real job at the magazine was not writing about hip things. It was walking uh, two Sharpays named Moses and Abraham who belonged to the editor-in-chief and the publisher. And my job was to keep them alive and fed and keep the office stocked with like pens and supplies and to like hire the IT department. I was the office manager, um, but eventually had like put it in the ear of the editors that worked there that I wanted to start writing. Um, and they were like, great, you want to start writing? Like you're a free writer for us. You're going to write for us and wrote all sorts of things. And I'm still like so grateful to those editors who I'm still in touch with, you know, I'm not going to reveal how many years ago that was, but like so grateful because if you're there and they're giving you the opportunity, it's just like the craziest thing, you know, and you're busting, you're just working so hard to craft something that's 250 words that's publishable in this magazine and the feedback that they give you and how invested they are in making you better is very real. Um, so I, I feel really lucky to have had those editors uh, and working in magazines at that time was pretty exciting. 
I want to, I'm trying to position this in like, in terms of years, but I think it was before the Devil Wears Prada came out, which was this weird inflection point around people being really interested at what happened in magazines and in magazine culture. Um, but the way that the nylon office was run was haphazard at best and absolutely insane at worst. And like several editors at the off, like everyone was trying to get into Condé Nast um, or leave their jobs at Nylon to get into Condé Nast. And they would always tell me when there were openings for assistant jobs at Condé Nast magazines. So eventually I did make my way over there, you know, like feigning like four dentist appointments to go have interviews at Condé Nast. And uh, I think I lost a few jobs and then finally got a job at Allure magazine. So I was there next. Tell me if this is like a long-winded story. <laughs> no, but, no, this is great. Ultimately, that is, those are the two like heritage, traditional media publications that I've worked at in-house. I was at Allure for two years. And then I took a very big detour that had nothing to do with writing and moved to Los Angeles uh, and still worked for magazines, but on the image production side. So I was a fashion stylist for 10 years, um, which is its own form of storytelling. You get a brief, you have to execute the brief. You're just using visual cues to tell stories about the people you're styling you're, or the story, you know, the execution with a photographer, with a creative director, right? I, I do see those things as really connected. Um, but in the last uh, six or so years, I came back to wanting to write and really kind of clawing my way back to um, writing as a craft and writing as a tool in my life um, and also pitching stories because at this point I had had uh, you know like a career as a fashion stylist and I was around a lot of really interesting conversations that I wanted to write about. Um, so it was interesting to pivot back into writing because I could say to an editor, hey, I'm a fashion stylist, but I'm really interested in perfume or, but I was on set and I heard this really interesting like tidbit about uh, a new restaurant that has this going on. So like, it was a way of getting leads and coming at um, publishing from like a side angle of just being like, I'm not a writer, I'm a fashion stylist, but this is, a piece that I'd like to write for you. And it was a good hook at the time. And now I'm like fully back. I'm not taking on shoots unless they're commercials, which I will still consider doing for, for, for the day rate. Um, but, uh, but I have um, definitely in the last few years been focusing on craft, on um, trying, to, trying to write with a cadence and trying to go deeper into the topics that I write about. And it's very fulfilling. Cool. That, that was super interesting. Just like, I, I, I love how just anyone's career, I think is just has these interesting paths that are like unexpected. And it seems like you were just sort of following your interests as you went. Um, so you mentioned, you mentioned, so you're doing this, this styling and and then you're sort of using those stories or things you've observed there to sort of pitch story ideas. And I'm wondering if that is sort of how you found, like you, you sort of have a beat, if you will, which is like like scent writing, or I guess you call it olf olfaction, olfactive culture. I don't know how to say that. But, yes. um, but I'm wondering if that was something you were already doing before that, or like, how did you even get into that? It seems, it seems very specific, you know? It is specific and I feel like I lucked into something that's really specific. Uh, you know, I think for people who are really interested in sneakers, for example, or really interested in movies, it's a little bit more, there's a collective already writing about them. There are established critics already writing about them. You know, it's like a bigger field to kind of elbow your way into. Um, I got really lucky. I, you know, I remember when I first started working at magazines, I really admired critics. Like uh, Kathy Horan is an incredible critic. She's now at New York Magazine, but she used to be at the New York Times. She's a fashion critic, very smart. Um, Peter Sheldahl is an amazing arts critic. Uh, I really, I mean, there's any number of phenomenal movie critics that people can cite as, you know, I, I like, and there is this amazing perfume critic. 
uh, named Chandler Burr. And he's a great writer. And it, it's so colorful, I think, when, when criticism is your way into something. Um, it's a really interesting world. There, it always feels like someone is leading you through exploration. Someone is teaching you about the principles of that field through criticism. Um, and I remember always being really interested in reading stuff about fragrance. And then when I was at Allure, oh my gosh, I had this crazy, crazy section that I would contribute to where I would take a fragrance. And I like every month I would have to take a fragrance that I was assigned, I couldn't choose it, right? So like, let's say it was like Michael Kors Golden or something. And I had to pick a place and then test the fragrance on random strangers and <laughs> record their responses. Uh, so like, you know, this fragrance is inspired by like the Greek breezes of, you know, the Isle of Crete. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna take it to this Greek restaurant and find people to test this fragrance on and write down their responses. It was a pretty silly feature. I enjoyed doing it. I don't know if that led me to where I am today, um, but it definitely had me sniffing a lot of perfume. And I think the only way to start feeling confident talking about fragrance is to smell a lot of it. Um, more to your question though, uh, I had always, I think another pretty meaningful point is when you start getting into like the world of niche fragrances, less like imagine not going to the mall and getting spritzed from every direction, but going to a store like Le Labo, for example, or Frederick Mall and going in and actually learning about the 10 fragrances that they have. And that feels more like an interesting tasting experience or an educational experience because you're learning about like artistry instead of being like, trying, you know, being forced to try to buy something. Uh, so I always really enjoyed that. And then um, my husband had, when my daughter was around two and I was stuck at home uh, with her, he encouraged me to take advantage of this resource we had in Los Angeles. Um, we were living in LA at the time and Los Angeles has a nonprofit uh, educational institute called the Institute of Art and Olfaction. And it's really punk and it's this space and it has a huge fragrance organ of all fragrance of all the materials the like very rare materials that go into fragrance very obscure materials like you might know about lavender and vetiver but like uh you know uh, uh citronellol or um iso e super right all these like ingredients that are actually chemicals from uh aroma houses that go into fragrance so they had this organ and then they had classes where you could learn about all the materials in this organ. And uh, I was like, oh, maybe I'll sign up for one class. And my husband, bless his heart, was like, you should sign up for like a three month course. And that's always the right answer, right? Like a one-off gets you nowhere, but like a serious commitment of being like, okay, I'm gonna spend X amount of money and I'm gonna do this every Tuesday for four hours um, was really powerful. And I did a bunch of those courses. Uh, I'm happy to share the Institute of Art and Olfactions um, website in the chat because they're amazing. And now all their programming is digital, um, which it wasn't at the time. You had to go to this tiny room in the middle of Chinatown in Los Angeles, in downtown LA. Um, but now so much, they've like figured out how to get materials to you and, and you can kind of, uh, learn about these materials and experience a ton of their incredible programming and lectures, um, digitally. So anyway, I basically had access to this really unique education that most people don't have access, don't make time for very, very hard to access online. Um, it's not as like information about fragrance is not as readily available for example, as like information about cooking or recipes, like the, the industry is very guarded. Um, so once I went through a bunch of the programming and started realizing like either I'm going to want to make fragrance myself or I want to just use this knowledge and write about it, um, I picked the second one. <laughs> and started pitching stories around interest, things that I found interesting about fragrance from this really like having an educational underpinning of it. Um, and that resonated with the editors who wanted to hire me, which was not just like, oh, I find this thing really beautiful. 
But I find this thing really beautiful because there's something unique in the formula that your readers might be curious about. So that is how I gained access to, like how I basically broke into scent writing, which is that I went into the educational experience first, didn't know where I was gonna take it uh, and then leveraged it. Well, wow, that's so interesting. I feel like, so I live in wine country and I feel like there's some parallels there too, a little bit. Um, there's just people get kind of steeped in it to all the little like, you know, nuance of it. Um, super interesting. Uh, and then you've also, you've also done writing about culinary things as well. Like, like your latest piece that I read about pasta straws for New York magazines, the strategist, which is, you know, it's also kind of a very specific beat in a way. Um, and by the way, that's how I found out that you're pregnant. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, but, but um, yeah, so I, I it seems like there are kind of like tied together in a way, um, you know, similar culture and things like that. Um, but I'd be curious. So that kind of navigating the traditional publishing world, um, like when you got involved, like you started, you said you were pitching these stories to editors and things like that. Were they kind of already, were these editors already familiar with you in some sense, or were you coming in cold, just going like, Hey, I'm, I'm from off the street and I have this interesting background and here's the story idea. Um, that is like the DNA of a great pitch, even if it's a cold pitch, by the way, which is, hi, I'm a really big reader of your, of your, you know, me insert media entity here. I like, uh, I, I loved your recent coverage of X and Y. I have this background. I wanted to share these pitches. I would love to start writing for you. Here's why. Um, here's why what I want to write for you is interesting for your readers. Like that's a cold pitch. Um, it's a great question. Uh, I knew, I want to say two or three of the editors that I started pitching to initially. Um, the others were cold pitches um, and things that I just was like, I feel like this is something I would read in this publication. So I'm just gonna pitch the story. I picked an editor. I figured out how to contact her via email and I just sent it off and tried to res like really tried to personalize it and resonate it, like have it resonate with things that I knew she was interested in writing about because her byline was on certain pieces, right? You're really interested in fragrance as am I, here's my background. This is the piece I'd love to write for you. Um, you know, one of the pieces I wrote for Into the Gloss was based on going to a lecture with Luca Turin, who is a genius physicist. Uh, he is an olfactive scientist and he writes these zany fragrant, like books of fragrance reviews um, because he loves the, he's like beloved in the fragrance industry. And I went to a science lecture from Luca. And then I basically at the end just asked him what fragrances he found interesting, right? That was my scoop was just like straight from his mouth. This is what he told me. Um, so some pitches kind of write themselves and other pitches you can like, you can strike out and then say, what are, what are the kinds of stories you're interested in? Like, I want to be able to cater my pitches to something that your audience cares about. So, you know, can you, can you give me a sense of like, uh, what are what are the types of stories in this category that have done really well for you? Um, I did want to shout out the pasta straw story for for context. Um, I was served a spin drift in a very nice Italian restaurant because I'm not drinking wine right now, and so my husband got a beautiful glass of minerally white wine, and I got a freaking cucumber spin drift that was served with a straw. And when I tasted the straw, I was like, this isn't plastic. This is some sort of like hard starchy material. And we discovered that the straw was made of plastic as part of a uh, sustainability effort on, on the part of the restaurant. Um, and in keeping with their like on brand Italian kind of thing, they had sourced these pasta straws and it was so perfect to pitch to the strategist, which is about like delightful things you can buy online that have a story to them, right? And so understanding that like, I probably would not spend 10 hours working on a pasta straw story if I didn't know exactly who it was for and who it was going to land with. Um, but the story became even more fun when it kind of became about sniffing out a trend. Okay, what other restaurants are serving these straws? What else are people saying when they get them? Are they as delighted as me? And what happens when we try these straws at home? 
uh, the, the TLDR is that this, the straws like really warp in your drink if you leave them for more than 45 minutes. So it's a little bit like less on the sustainability meter because you, they don't really work after a little while, but they're definitely better than paper. Um, but the story is charming and, and like a fun summer story. Uh, and I think also knowing, starting to get a feel for what media publications want, like what does really well for them? What is the tone? What are the rhythms of their pieces? Um, and the only way to get that is by reading them and, and kind of knowing, okay, I'm the audience for this, or um, I may not be the audience for this, but the audience for this wants actionable takeaways. So I need to make sure that whatever the, the thing that I pitch to this publication has five actionable takeaways. That seems to be like the template here. Um, so whether or not you have a personal connection with an editor, it's wonderful when you do because they can give you feedback on whether your pitch is good enough. Ultimately, an editor has to circulate your pitch to their editor. So whether or not your friend thinks your idea is good doesn't really matter, right? It has to be in this kind of like reworked way for their editor to approve it and, and have it this kind of brand approval where you're writing for the platform, but the, pla but the platform is commissioning you to write something that is like in the voice of the platform. Um, so yeah, that is <laughs> a bit of a long answer. <laughs> No, that's interesting. I, I mean, it makes sense because it's it's like they have a specific. I like the idea of thinking about it like you're not just pitching the editor; you're pitching someone beyond that that you have no control over, really. So it's like you have to kind of play to what they're looking for and and take that into account, and not just you know they're not just going to go out on a limb because they think you're interesting or something. So it's like tailor it to to make sense for their audience. I, um, I would. Lyle, I would also add to that, right? Like there's times where you're the person to tell the story. You're the person who has access to this tidbit of information, right? I'm, I'm the one who uh, asked Luca Turin the question after his lecture, so I'm the only person with that. But let's say you wanted to write a story about Selena Gomez or something, right? In which case you don't necessarily, you're not the person with access. You may never be able to get access. So the question is, why are you the person to write the story? Or what are you seeing that other people are not seeing? You know, or, or like, do you have access to her hairdresser who can confirm or deny something that you want to write about? Or maybe that person is tied to an example of something that you're seeing elsewhere. And so you're using a smaller story or you're using an example to break open a story that only you see. And I think those are really interesting ways to think about pitches, not just cultural or product pitches, but um, when you're pitching cold or not to an, to any sort of traditional media publication, they're always going to ask, okay, why are we, why is this going to come out of our freelance budget to assign to you, right? Can you deliver what we need you to deliver? And why are you the person to write this story if we're taking a chance on you for the first time? So bringing a bit of your DNA and who you are or what you have access to or what your experience or what your education is into that mix is can make all the difference, right? You're obviously not sending an essay introducing yourself, um, but you have to find the right balance of the idea and why you're the person to write about that idea. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, because I think it's it's really easy for people to go like, I have wrote this thing and now I'm gonna go find a place for it and and maybe, you know, trying to like put the like, you know, square peg into a round hole type thing. Um, so, from your experience, it seems like you've done like different types of writing. Like, I think I saw you did one where it was even like a, an interview with someone or, you know, that kind of thing. I'd be curious, uh, you know, what is your, your process look like um, from like, kind of like the initial mm -hmm. concept of an idea to like the fi finished product. And like, how does that vary depending on like the type of piece you're writing? Like, you know, how creative you could get with it or, or those kind of things. That's a really good question. I would say that my process veers towards chaotic, no matter what. Um, and usually things kind of uh, uh, ricochet around my brain for a little bit before I feel like I can um, articulate them, right? It, 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 like I, I'm a slow marinator. Like I cannot, I do not have, one of the reasons I've been freelance 
and have been very controlled over my pace and my pitching pace is because I don't have a lot of great ideas. And I don't think that all my ideas are good. Um, and I know that there are writers who are bust, I mean, just hustling and hustling so many ideas and they're not precious with their ideas. And I think there's something to that too, which is like, just pump it out, pump out the pitch, you know, three more, three more, three more. I am a little bit more precious with my ideas and I take a little bit more time to marinate on them. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. It just is the way that I operate. And, um, and it is also a way I feel that my writing comes across pretty personally, no matter what format you're writing, you almost feel like maybe you feel the time I spent with the idea, even if it's something as silly as pasta straws, you know, it's, it's kind of true. Um, however, that said, the format is often uh, defined by the editor or I have the opportunity to pitch it. And, and I mean, something like a Q and A is really interesting. And this is something I, I like taught at um, On Deck Writers Fellowship. Um, which is basically that anytime you're reading a Q&A that's in a magazine or in a digital media, you know, it's so heavily edited and condensed. Um, and it is also so, uh, so changed from the original transcript. I mean, I think anyone here who has had experience with podcasts and then reading the transcript of a podcast, A, knows how long a 30 minute or a 60 minute conversation actually runs in print very, very long, um, and be how uninteresting it is to read a direct transcript. Um, so the work that goes into a Q&A that is like a typical Q&A for a magazine, which is like introduction and then Q&A, right? And doesn't, you, you don't immediately understand how many times the questions have been reworked after the interview, how many times the answers have been reworked, si simplified, you know, uh, streamlined, reoriented, something from the end of the interview becomes the first question that's asked, you know, the introduction gets rewritten four times to like really make sure and enhance what the piece is actually about. Um, because also reading very meandering Q and A's is not that interesting and it like readers lose interest. And the very, very like basic point of publishing something is to have a reader read it from the first sentence to the last sentence. Um, and if you think about all pieces that are, you know, that's why we have these editing structures is ultimately editors are making sure that you're getting from the, that the reader is getting from the first sentence to the last sentence. Um, so Q and A's is like actually a very creative process, even though it feels like it's not because you feel like you're just kind of uh, conveying information that other people are saying. There's a lot of um, reworking the structure there uh, and creating a flow. Um, and then I think I, I do pretty well with an existing structure if I know that I can reference other things the strategist has written versus like, for example, newsletter writing, you can do whatever you want when you publish your newsletter. And I think some people work really well when they create a structure for themselves. Okay, my newsletter is gonna have, you know, four things I'm really into, um, a, a recommendation on an article and a rant, for example, at the end. And, and people who use templates to help them structure their writing versus people who are so invigorated by, freeform writing, um, I would probably say that I do better with a template and, and understand why uh, and, and what voice goes where and how it should sound. Um, but I have experimented with freeform writing and I'm trying to find a handle on feeling empowered by not having any sort of like preconceived notions about what the writing is gonna look like or sound like too. So I've had the opportunity to publish a couple of essays and that's been really fun. There is a traditional essay structure editorially. Oh my God, is there? And a long history of incredible essay writers, Joan Didion to say, you know, like as a shining example, um, I would never like ascribe, like I would never put myself in that caliber ever at all. But I think we one can aspire, right? And when you start to like edge in or stretch into a new medium, you start to figure out who you admire in that medium and try to understand editorially what, what they're doing and what you can do differently. Um, so I think 
and this goes to something else that I taught at ODW, which is like understanding structures that are underneath the things that you so enjoy reading and understanding why they work so well. Yeah, that was that was one of my favorite sessions was the long form writing, um, and and you introducing me to the to the memoir style essay, the Crane Wife, which I love, and I've reread like two or three times since, just because it's it's just it's that's like it's something to aspire to, right? Uh, as a memoir style writer myself, um, but uh, I thought it was very useful for you know thinking about how to deconstruct these pieces and why they work, you know. Um, and like hit us on an emotional level or whatever they're trying to get, you know, get across some point in a compelling way. I'd be curious when you've done that, um, if there are any similarities or like high level takeaways that you see, like that are kind of a, go across all of those different pieces, even though they might be different, you know, like could be like political ones or like the crane wife's obviously a lot different. Uh, is there any sort of like similarities or high level takeaways that those have? That is a really good question. Um, I can answer it on a, on a kind of like bundled form, um, which is, I'll start, I'll start off with the fact that um, it is an amazing experience to go back and reread uh, long form articles that you were like, oh, this piece was great. Or, oh, this short fiction, you know, story that has been circulated and that I read last year, I would like to read again with fresh eyes, you know, revisiting like these incredible works of, um, you know, long form article writing is really interesting. The long form podcast is great to listen to if you're interested in this because they talk to long form journalists and you get a lot of insight into how long it takes for people to write these pieces. You know, we're talking six months for a New Yorker piece, if not three years, right? How many people are involved in a piece like uh, a New Yorker science piece on artificial sugar, right? And, and also um, how, uh, how when you revisit them, you understand how the structure is actually very cinematic and narrative, no matter what the topic. So I don't think that there is like a takeaway necessarily from, you know, memoir writing to a New Yorker piece on, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of like obscure, you know, on Alex Ohanian, the founder of Reddit, right? Like, I'm not sure that there are some big, but, among specific publications, specifically New Yorker style, there are takeaways um, from how their pieces are structured. And there are certain kind of overarching principles that once you know them, you start seeing them in the ways that they, that they um, utilize rhythm and like the structure of the piece as it progresses in really similar ways. So um, in my long form breakdown, uh, class, for better, lack of a better word, right? Uh, we took articles, we had everybody read them, and then we kind of talked about um, why the writer made certain choices as they went through the piece. And the choices could be everything from, uh, you know, the writer breaks the fourth wall here and addresses the reader directly, um, you know, or uses third person. Why did the writer choose to use dialogue so heavily instead of, you know, the first person, like just things, about, um, and then also how is the writer harnessing multiple timelines or why is the art, the writer zooming out to introduce us to the background of the sugar industry when we're actually looking at this one company in Tokyo and, and how they're um, kind of evolving artificial sugars, you know, into less caloric, uh, wonderful treats. So, so like the New Yorker does this great job because there is always a tone of being your tour guide through this like fantastic world that you never knew you were interested in. And, and they, they never are too um, reliant on giving you all the information you need. It's more like, how do I cultivate a sense of discovery where my reader is the hero? And as I take my reader through and start giving them puzzle pieces and start illustrating the entire like ecosystem that populates this topic, um, how does my reader feel smart and informed along the way? And then also what are the like editorial breaks that I can give them? So like hardcore, hardcore information, right? And then like, uh, 
really great exchange with a taxi driver, right? Hardcore, hardcore information. Like, you know, then I tasted this piece of chocolate and here is an entire paragraph devoted to how the chocolate tasted from the writer's perspective. Um, and it's like, they, it's so interesting to me because it reminds me so much of movie editing, right? When like movies take you on tangents or they present a montage or they zero in on a really, really tight frame of something so you can savor it for a minute before it zooms out again. It's like a lot of director's choices, which are not dissimilar from editor's choices, um, edit, like a, a literary editor's choice. So with The New Yorker, once you start to see those and pick up on those um, cues, you start realizing that they're like, it's a journey. It's an arc, just like anything else. And if you map out the topic that you're writing about, you could probably start to think about mapping it out in a New Yorker way and cover the topic. That is if you're ready to write nine pages worth on a topic, because <laughs> they're really long. Um, you know, uh, in terms of looking at memoir um, or autofiction, which is the buzzword of the last two days, if it's if anyone's been on Twitter or looking at the um, kind of, uh, at, there was a slate piece published about um, the story of uh, Cat Person and how it was actually based on another writer's experiences with their ex-boyfriend and how those two stories are linked and what actually happened there. Um, Lyle can link to it in the chat if anyone's curious about it. Um, but I think, I think with memoir, there is also a lot of cues from cinema that inform it. And there's a lot of controlling the writer's uh, intent, like the intensity of experience while you're reading it. So there's always this sense that like you ramp up um, in the intensity of the things that you're introducing and then you kind of diffuse it and then you ramp up again and then you offer something to diffuse it. But there is a lot of internal... Ooh. Sorry, there is a lot of internal um, mapping and plotting that is done that overlays a memoir, a work of memoir or an autofiction or, or short fiction. It's all in how a story is plotted and it never reads that way if it's good. It always feels so naturalistic and so like the story just poured out of the person, but in fact, it is like pretty rigorously mapped. And I think starting to look for those plot points as a reader is really fun. And when you start to approach something that you really enjoyed and start to say like, I wonder why they did this thing or what can I learn about writing a great introduction? Like what I always think about, because I think starting something is always the hardest. Doesn't matter what you're starting or let's say you wrote the thing and then you're like, okay, but what is my starting point? What is the first paragraph? That to me will never feel good. It will always feel like the most stressful thing. And I think looking at each piece that you enjoy reading and saying, why did they choose this start point will give you so much information to then use when you look at your own work and try to understand what is the most interesting start point to bring your reader along on the journey. Um, you know, in that story, The Crane Wife, the start point is, you know, I had just called off my engagement and I'm here shopping for like a floppy hat with a rope around it because I'm about to go, you know, and I feel like, should I be doing this, right? It's this weird in-between moment that in itself doesn't have that much um, emotional, that much of an emotional load, but when you actually use it as this gateway for the reader to like, be like, oh, I've, I've been there shopping for like outdoor gear, you know, in preparation for a trip. And then the, the writer takes you all the way through this trip that breaks open a traumatic relationship and an ecological disaster all wrapped up into one memoir essay. Um, you know, it seems like as good, like it seemed like a very wise place to start um, unsuspecting, like with an unsuspecting audience of, you know, the audience doesn't know where they're going. And so she aligned the starting point of that essay with like in a very strong way with the reader. Yeah, I think I think for memoir style or like just personal stories in general, it's really easy 
to just go like, well, I'll start at the beginning and everything goes chronologically, right? It's really, and it could be hard to break out of that um, and go like, where, what is the start point? I had this experience recently. I, I wrote this like almost 4,000 word story and I submitted somewhere it got rejected, but then I just took it and I challenged myself to put it into like a less than 500 word flash fiction piece. Um, and I like it better, but it, but it was like, the starting point was like way after all the crazy stuff that happened in the story. So, but, um, so that resonates a lot, I think. Um, and, and what I, one interesting thing I thought about the crane wife that I remember, you know, so it is sort of plopping you in the middle of the story and then you can fill in details later, right? Like little flashbacks or whatever. Um, but then I remember there was a couple lines where <laughs> during the session you said, ah, I'm pretty sure the editor wanted her to write that line you know, things like that. So like there's, there's still, even in that sort of piece where it's very personal story, I think you, you, cause of all your experience, were able to see like, oh, there's like, there's a bit of a heavier, heavier hand in the editing on this particular line and things like that. So it's still gonna, there's still gonna be a fair amount of editing, even though it's a personal story. Yeah, one thing about that piece that's really interesting, and I think a lot of the conversation for anyone here who writes personal stories or um, is, is on track to putting personal stories in the public eye is that you're already starting to contend with all of the feedback you know you're going to get, which maybe if you're active on Twitter, you're well trained to receive and to respond to. Um, but in the event of publishing something personal that is in like a traditional publication, you, you need to already come out of the gate like swinging um, and addressing and anticipating the ways in which people are going to try to discount the things that you're saying. In this case, very, very, like the crane wife is about an abusive relationship. And the biggest thing that you know, an editor, maybe not the writer, but the editor who is publishing that piece is going to be saying is, okay, how much of this story is, you know, from your perspective? And are you telling us the truth? And how can you prove it? And how can you prove that your insights are well-deserved and, and justified? And like the editor is always going to be the voice of the reader that needs a reason to believe and to keep reading, right? The reader in the very beginning of your piece is like, okay, I'm gonna read this, I'm gonna believe it. Um, but there's a lot of points at anyone's writing where you could lose your reader and your editor's job is to make sure that you're addressing preemptively all of the points where you're gonna lose your reader. So maybe that's bad sentences of which I've had many, trust me. Oh my God, and long sentences. I like a long sentence. I like a comma. I am not down with the Oxford comma, um, but I know most people are. And uh, gosh, semicolons, colons, and M dashes. Um, you know, I, there's ways you can lose an edit, lose a writer because you say something that is too convoluted, too um, specific, too descriptive to the point where the person doesn't know why they're following all your descriptions, right? Like, where are you taking me? And what if I don't know what that means? And what if that's totally irrelevant? Um, there's just so many places you could lose uh, lose a reader. And it's just really interesting to recast a relationship with any editor, not as someone who's making you work harder when you get their feedback, but as somebody who's literally protecting you from losing the reader's attention. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, um, I wonder, because you mentioned maybe being too descriptive at times, and it made me think of your of scent writing, right? Because I think, I imagine that there's times where maybe people know it when they're going, getting into reading something about scent that it's like, okay, we're going to get really deep into a description. Yeah. And so the audience is more okay with that. But I wonder if there's, there's times where it's like, you know, you got to pull back the reins a little bit because you could go too deep on that. Um, or just curious to get your thoughts on just like descriptive writing in general. Cause I really enjoyed the scent writing class as well that you did. Um, because that's something that I, I want to get better at. I'm good at, I feel like I'm good at like the narrative flow of things, but not necessarily like zooming in and really getting descriptive with something. And, you know, I think it could be a challenge for some folks. So I'd be curious to hear more about that. Yes. I, I would love to talk about it because it's something that is, 
um, really fun for me. And it's something I do on multiple levels. Um, I also know it exhausts people to read. And then there's also this whole caliber of writing, which is defined as purple prose, which is just like, imagine just like really Baroque violin playing like gilded writing which is all style and like not saying anything right or not saying anything that readers understand so i can think of countless perfume ads that sound like that i think there's a lot of food writing there's music writing that i read that's totally over my head maybe it uses industry industry terms you know if you think about like basically i zoomed out and created a lesson like a lesson plan around um language that's used to describe sensory experiences and that could be sensory experiences in the art in in the arts in taste in describing visual art in you know even like anything that describes the things that we experience in our bodies and how how hard it is to match that up with language that resonates for a reader. And then also how do you make that language sing instead of just saying, you know, I'm looking at a glassy blue lake. Okay. But like, how do you make that language immersive? What, it, what defines um, really beautiful descriptive writing, you know, usually the domain of like poetry. Um, is there a way to harness uh, how we think about descriptions to actually create readers that are even more alert and attentive or who are surprised by how good and how um, resonant a description is? Like, I think you can lose readers with description or you can like jolt them alive through description. And so I wanted to explore that um, in the best way to explore that as an exercise, let alone like as a career writing about scent, fine, but as an exercise that brings you deep into your body and then trying to connect sensation with words, it's really fun. And you could do it with like, taste is clearly the easiest access point. because so you're like, yeah, I'll totally do this with a bar of chocolate or a glass of wine or, you know, spaghetti bolognese, like, great. I'm gonna have this thing in front of me and I'm gonna take a bite and I'm gonna sit with the experience and I'm going to try to write about it in a way that is interesting and fresh and not stale, markety or, you know, purple. Um, and I think, and so I started like my actual, um, my actual kind of insights around sensory language is that you can pull from multiple senses to describe things and, um, that ultimately things read purple when you do not ground them in truth, when you are aiming to be too descriptive and too poetic, but that the fundamental truth of the thing, right, chocolate is bitter. If that is not coming through in the, in the kind of like calculus of words that you're using, and, and it just seems like you're talking around something but that there's no core understanding of what you're actually trying to say, um, that's when you can lose people. But so when you do sensory analysis in language, you always wanna start with the building blocks, like really simple descriptions of what something smells like or tastes like or what color something is. And then you kind of build off of those things in a creative, like in a creative way where you kind of brainstorm around different ways of expressing the things that are true. And you can use humor and you can use um, other kind of other domains of things that are interesting. Like what is the, um, you know, if, if, if you're really into music, you can, you can bring in like examples from music to describe food and that can create a language of association um, that is resonant for you. And, and it's like drawing on different vocabularies and drawing on action words and, and drawing on the kind of weird physical sensations around being human experiencing something. Um, so it is, it's very interesting. Like, you don't need to smell a perfume to get into scent writing. You can literally sit with an apple and you can try to define in words what that apple smells like to you. And then if you were, let's say, writing a piece of investigative journalism in which an apple is on the table, right? You can say, I sat at the table interviewing my subject with a bowl full of Granny Smiths in between us. Or you can say like the summer heat brought out the stale, um, the stale honeyed smell of the Granny Smiths at the table between me 
and Mrs. Jones. And, and it's this moment of like total human uh, in your bodiness that the reader is experiencing that puts them in the scene in a way that is so much stronger. So you don't need to like wax poetic about smell for seven sentences, but you can use a well-placed description that you've distilled in any type of writing and it will wake the reader up and bring them into a scene that is more real than the one you had written before. That is, that is my, that's my cell on sensory writing and scent writing, that it is worth it for everyone to do it. And it's also really fun and it's really good to train your nose and your nose does get better at picking up various smells. And it's also just like, what a joy to live this life and be able to spend five minutes meditating on something that you usually never notice or put into words. Yeah. I love that. I think it's, I think it's great, a great, almost like a trick for like, can you find moments that are just like you, what you just said, that example you gave was very fast. It was only like a few words really of like changing it from just like there were apples on the table to something more interesting. Um, and it could be just like this little like sprinkle of surprise for a reader, which can, like you say, like keep that momentum going so that they keep reading. Um, so I really love that. I think, I think there's like, I wonder though, also on the flip side, are there times where you go, maybe it doesn't make sense to do that because it'll detract from something, um, you know, and you're going to go to more of like maybe a banal like type of description of something or, or maybe, maybe omit it entirely, you know? Totally. I, I mean, I think like I edited a lot of writing in ODW, you know, I had six workshops a week. There were four writers every week uh, circulating different types of writing. Um, I think you see a lot of short story writers who are um, taking every sentence to very vividly describe um, the surroundings. And in those cases, I see this a lot with short stories or um, people approaching fiction. Uh, the descriptions feel well-tooled, but they feel like they are getting in the way of the story advancing or moving. Um, and I think that you, if you start with the descriptions or if the descriptions are your access point to writing, you need to very, very critically replot your story once you have a draft and make sure that you are not actively like procrastinating the plot, especially for something like a short story, which I lay no claim to do well at all, at all, and, and think is so hard. Um, but it is... Uh, you know, I think, I think it is like a procrastination mechanism or as a comfort mechanism for people who are very vi visual or very descriptive or who find a lot of joy, like myself, in describing things. Um, it kind of keeps us away from like the real meat of the story. And there are always going to be readers who are like, just get to it. Like, where are we going with this? Um, something that George Saunders says in uh, his most recent book, uh, which is about the Russian short story, is that if you are working towards one plot point in your short story, you should just get it out of the way in the very beginning to see what comes after that. And if you're just so precious about that one plot point, then your story is going to suck. But like, if you just like get it out of the way, you don't work up to it at all. You just like put it up in the front and then see what happens after. Um, that's when stories get interesting. And it's very hard, especially if you feel like you have one good idea and that's like the thing that you're writing um, to be told that you should like not beat around the bush and, and treat it so preciously, but actually like, you know, have that as your very starting point. And then that's when the work begins. It's a, it's a good reorientation. Um, uh, that and I resonates think, so much. <laughs> yeah, I think description and a lot of description is definitely a procrastination method for sure. And I think with scent writing too, for anyone here who has experience with scent writing, a lot of it, your eyes kind of glaze over and you're like, okay, I, I'm getting like, I'm just being set this whole scene, which usually trades on like sexuality or pleasure or decadence or opulence or beauty or, or like, you know, the beauty of nature, like fragrance has this kind of domain over sen you know, the sensory pleasures of life that now just feel like visual Instagram. Um, but it's also like if there is not some sort of mounting intensity, which usually has to do with plotting your writing, um, it's very easy to get to just like 
glaze over and not want to finish the thing that you're reading. Um, humor is another way of getting, of, of cutting through description, humor and wit. I wish I had more of it as a writer. There are definitely some writers here who have it in abundance and I see you and I know you all. Uh, so it's just like, I think that's also a wonderful way to play with the intensity of your writing, which is when you cut through your own tone um, to kind of jolt the reader awake again, but yeah. Yeah, I definitely lean on that more than descriptive stuff for my writing. Um, Cool. Well, we have a few more minutes left, so I want to be mindful of the time. But uh, I may, I'd be curious if you want to talk about this. But you know, ODW is no longer so. Like you're not, you're still working with on deck, but it's in a much different capacity. But I'd be curious because you're you're doing things on the content side of the business. Um, but are you? I'm just curious how you're thinking about, or like, are you able to leverage your experience in? storytelling and reporting and stuff like that to kind of like hopefully elevate the quality of the content that you're doing and maybe just tell us a little bit about what you are doing yeah if, you, if you're so, open to it um odw for you know uh i know that so many um people in the foster community have gone through um on deck writers and vice versa and it's just these like really um like they make amazing companion programs and also keep writers on, on cadence, on track of like continuing to not only work on their craft, but to have accountability in their writing. Um, I definitely feel like in, in terms of facilitating on deck writers, uh, I was around so many inspiring people who were producing work at a cadence that I had never previously produced work at and was in turn inspired by all of these amazing writers I got to be surrounded by. Um, it's also very helpful to know that everyone has the same resistance to writing and around writing and that that's okay. Um, and it's, it's really helpful to also feel the push from everyone. Uh, so I am very, like obviously we still have a thriving community from, from the three cohorts of on deck writers. Um, I know that it is on pause and that there is going to be another iteration in the future, which I'm really excited about, um, but I don't have details on it. And uh, for now, my, <laughs> my role became someone who writes content at a um, business that's focused on uh, startups, entrepreneurship, um, you know, uh, the future of tech, the future of industry, the future of business, all parts of the internet that I was not previously reading. Um, so it's been a very big, like, and an and interesting challenge. Um, and also locating my strengths or, or holding tight to the things that I know to be true, which is that the language, you know, I'm not employing scent writing when I'm talking about a company that recently raised $5.8 million in seed funding, but I am employing like fundamentals of storytelling and why a story is interesting and why an idea is interesting and why a person has beat the odds or what is the inflection, you know, charting inflection points in something that presents a, a vision to readers that they may not have seen before. Um, so that's what I'm trying to focus on as my North Star in terms of wrapping my brain around new kinds of writing. Um, I also do think that like being a writer and stretching out into new forms is really interesting, even if it doesn't always feel good. Um, <laughs> There are times where it doesn't feel good, but I mean, if you're a writer who writes about, you know, politics and 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 really really enjoys op-ed writing, and you try your hand at um, short, you know, short fiction, that also doesn't always feel great. Sometimes it can feel like a really big release, and other times it feels like a like you're so much dumber than you ever thought you were, and that's also a good feeling in retrospect to to be humbled by by a craft that you think you have, but you may not have it in this application. So I am on the on deck content team. It's really fun. I feel like I have this insane vision into the future because on deck is always pioneering new programs at the forefront of where technology is going. So for example, I'm starting to write about people who are in the longevity space of biotech or deep tech. I did not know what deep tech meant before. Um, just like you probably don't know what a Shepra is, you know, or like a very specific type of fragrance. Like we all have our worlds. Um, 
I have been so, it feels so good to be in a niche. It also feels so good to be challenged to be doing other things and try to calibrate what you think is good writing in an area you don't know about. Totally. Yeah. That resonates with some of the freelance stuff I've been doing. Um, so we are a little over time, but just before we go, um, is anything, anything on the horizon besides a baby on the way, um, maybe yeah. like writing wise that you wanted to, to plug or anything like that? Otherwise we can, uh, we can say bye. Well, thank you so much. This has been really fun, Lyle. Um, I, uh, I don't have any big writing to plug. I am having a baby in October. Um, I have never been doing more writing on a daily basis, but less planning of the writing that I'm doing. Um, I do hope I have on my website, if you go to natalietorin.com, I have a sign up for a newsletter. Um, and, uh, you know, it sounds just like my kind of chaos to be, um, launching that around the time that I have a baby. Uh, but so you can sign up and, and it, it may come in the next few months um, as like a, a kind of, um, as like a fully formed idea around the senses and, um, you know, sensory writing and around uh, some elements of, of fragrance writing and food, um, but not specifically, like you wouldn't have to be super interested in those fields to find it interesting. So that is all in the works. Um, and yeah, I hope I get to do more of these sessions around uh, long form writing and um, sensory writing as well. I'm trying to figure out if I can continue doing them for people who are really interested. So stay tuned on that too. Awesome, yeah, I will go sign up for that right after this. Um, cool. Well, thank you so much for being here and thanks everyone for joining live. Uh, it was good to see some old familiar faces. Um, yeah. yeah. And, um, this will be up, uh, not too long on YouTube and on the podcast and stuff. So we'll, uh, we'll spread the word about that, but thank you so much for Natalie. It was great talking to you. That's so, I so appreciated everyone for coming and so good to see you all. <laughs> Take care. Awesome. Bye. Thank you.